And I was writing the same old stuff that I would write to the other albums. I was writing it and I was just like, man, I'm like, I kind of feel played out on this. And honestly, we were in this, like the middle of a pandemic. Uh, I was in isolation for months, you know, and like, I don't know, the world was terrible. Things at home were too good. Uh, everything was looking pretty grim. And I was like, if I focus on all this terrible shit in the world again for another record, like I'm not going to be able to survive this shit. Like it's, it was just a little yeah. bit too much. Hi, welcome back to the Headbangers podcast, where your host Nathan and Brad. Here today we're joined by Kyle from Wake. How are you doing, man? Start off with. Good. How are you guys doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Um, so we like to start off with like a little icebreaker. Um, what's your funniest gig or tour story that you can recall? Funniest gig story, hey? Yeah. Oh man. I, and I if any go- wakes all do. Wakes all doom and gloom, man. We don't have fun on tour. <laughs> <laughs> that is the doom way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I can't really think of anything too hilarious that's happened to us on tour. It's usually pretty fucking crazy stuff. So. <laughs> and, uh, like I, tires I, flying off our van and shit like that. So <laughs> That sounds like a good story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, coming, we're coming back from a, a gig in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan here in Canada. We had our back wheel fly off, so that was fun. How did that happen? Uh, all the, the, the bolts holding on the lug nuts just busted off. The fuck? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah but it, we were driving, of... and our, our guitar player, Arjun, was like, something feels weird in the van. I was like, oh, <laughs> great. And then right, as soon as he said that, it was like clunk, and the tire just fucking flew way off to the side. We were wow. dragging the back end on the ground, and it's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. You got to think as well, like, you're doing a lot of mileage on them, so sometimes it's only like a yeah. matter of time before it goes. <laughs> yeah, that that... That van got us around, but it wasn't the best van for touring. <laughs> I mean, oh, thank yeah. God that like it, it could have definitely gone worse than just the time yeah. falling off. Like, damn. That's yeah, I, think I heard a story <laughs> once with like a, I think one of the, ba- the, the, the van broke down completely and they were like, I can't remember what band it was, but they were, tell- like, they were saying on their Instagram stories, like they, it's like literally stranded in like Eastern oh, Europe somewhere right now. And they're like, fuck. we need some funds for like a new van because this is fucked. <laughs> like, I, can't, I can't for the life of me remember the, the band, but yeah, I just saw on the story one day it popped up. It's like, can someone just, a, a, a 10 pounds like just to the GoFundMe for this new van because we're in oh Eastern my- Europe, nowhere to get home at the moment. Man, <laughs> that would be the worst. <laughs> oh man, I, I'd honestly be, sh- I'd, I'm really bad under pressure, especially with stuff like that. So I'd be like completely shit. I mean, I'll probably have like, I'll just be in the back of that broken down van, being like, let me know when it's just over. Screaming boys. like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like, <laughs> wake me up when it's over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, like, obviously, you guys, I, I think really mix like a really brutal sound, but still find a lot of me- like melody in there. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I think they, they complement each other quite well. Do you ever find that it's like a challenge to sort of play around with these two different sort of like, like well, not genres, but soundscapes? Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of the whole idea behind the, the new record there too, you know, is to have the super brutal elements, but have it, it's all really pretty sounding too, even though it is really heavy and brutal. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, writing it, some of it worked, some of it didn't work. You know, we had to go back to the drawing board for some of it, but. I mean, for the most part, starting with Devouring Rune, I think you could kind of hear us messing with those kind of soundscapes. Uh, Confluence, when we did that EP, we mixed them in a little bit more. And then I think Thoughtform Descent was kind of the uh, the pinnacle of all of that. Hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah think... I just find it very interesting because like, you just hear like these absolutely blasting drums and guitars, but... I, in between those, there's just, like these nice little compliments of melody in there. And I just think it adds so much to the overall sound of you guys. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, that is kind of what we're going for, you know, to just have this like really nice sounding, brutal record. Yeah, definitely. I think like it's one of the things that always like interests me is just the fact that you can have something so brutal but melodic, like and it's like, you know, cooking a dish and you, do, you don't want it to be too sweet or too salty, but then it's like to get that <laughs> balance must be must be kind of hard sometimes, you know? It, it, can, it can be tricky, man. And, you know, sometimes it even catches me off guard a little bit. You know, I come in, I'm like, whoa. I'm like, well, that's really pretty sounding. Like, you yeah. know, and sometimes it's like, I wonder like what fans are going to think of this, you know, before we actually are able to put it all together uh, and yeah. it becomes the songs that they are, you know, I'm like, is it going to be a little bit too like emo sounding or is it going to be a little bit too like nice sounding for this kind of music? But somehow we 
we keep melding all this shit together and it just, it just sounds like wake and it doesn't sound like either of those things. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think like there's so many bands out there try to execute it. Um, but not like hit straight away. But like, I feel like with you guys, obviously you mentioned towards like the back end of, of your previous album, you sort of played about with it. But I feel like in the two releases that we've got to hear, you've, you've hit it straight away. And it's like, oh, they've really figured this out. Um, that's why, that's why I kind of get, get from listening to it anyway. It's like, yeah. there's yeah, not, sure. there's not, there wasn't like a sim- symbol, a like single section where I was there. Like this sounded out of place. It all flowed really well together. Yeah. Well, that's the hope. The hope is that we we sound like we got something figured out anyways. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I was going to ask actually, like, you know, the, the core fundamentals of your sound, like how long do you think it took you to be able to figure that out? Like, you know, this is the work sound. Because um, I feel like you guys are really good at sort of morphing like riffs and drum patterns. Like you'll, you'll let one simmer for a while. Like it won't just like change every two seconds and it feels rushed. Like it, you'll really make one work for ages and you add like another section on. So like, you know, how did that come about? How did you say, but well, this is work now, you know? Well, it's kind of hard because when, when, like when you're saying like the wake sound, I don't think wake has really figured out a wake down, but we have found yeah. a way to make all these other like all this stuff that we're writing sound like wake, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, because that's the thing is like, I, I, I can't like, I'm not trying to be that guy, be like, oh, you can't really put us in a genre, but like, I really don't know where you could stick us. Like we're not brutal death metal. We're not black metal. We're not hardcore. We're not grindcore anymore. <laughs> you know, like it's all over the place. So I, I don't know. I think it's just, we have a really good knack of, uh, of taking all these sounds and putting them together and still having it sound like wake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think like it, it's so interesting now. So, because I, I feel like, met, like, met, like obviously we all know all metalheads. Like everyone has to put something in a genre. It's like this mm-hmm. over compulsive yeah. like thing that all <laughs> metalheads have. It's like it has to be this like, over genreizing things. Yeah, it's like you have like a laundry list of like subgenres. Like that's what my band is. <laughs> yeah, and I feel I feel like it's great seeing bands going. Ah, to be fair, we're not going any, for anything specific. We just don't want to stick to one thing like it's so refreshing like Definitely. seeing that from bands going hey whatever you think we are that's what we are but we're just yeah, doing yeah. our own thing yeah exactly i wonder where that whole like over genre right and over genre rising thing came with metalheads like why we like doing it so much it's just such a, <laughs> a weird thing but we all like to do it and i don't know why it's kind of fun i don't know it's it kind is. of fun it to be like that fun. sometimes but at the same time, you know, it's like when you started out with metal music, it was like, okay, you have death metal, you have thrash metal, you have yeah. hardcore. And then, you know, you start, those genres start grabbing from all the different corners and that's creating more subgenres. And then, you know, everyone's grabbing from those corners until it's like a kaleidoscope of subgenres. Yeah. And it's just like, like an endless amount of shit you can grab from. And like, it's weird. Uh, I was reading some reviews about this new Wake record. And like we had people comparing it to the Smashing Pumpkins. Really? I'm like, wow. man, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And that's, that's kind of like the weird thing is like people will always hear different kinds of music in your music, stuff that you aren't even aware yeah. that they'll hear, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I feel like it's one, it, you always get like that message back, you know, like if you send a friend like a track. Like, I, I had it with Brad today. I, I just sent him like one that me and my band like sort of working on at the moment. He was like, mm-hmm. oh, it kind of sounds like a, a mix between hardcore, death metal and black metal. I'm like, we won't go for that. But I, like, okay. <laughs> I, You're like, cool, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we were just going for like straight hardcore there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah it, it's, so, it's so funny. Like, hey, like, you know, like to yourself, you're like, oh, this is just this. But when you get like another perspective on it, it you just, yeah. everyone's like, oh no, this is this. And you're like, you sure like, that's not what we're putting down like, i mean I, I get i get that when i send tracks to friends who are like oh yeah this sounds like, like what are you talking about that doesn't sound anything like what i thought it sounded like <laughs> but yeah that's 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 a cool thing about music and metal especially and like metal today too is like it's just everything is everything you know so yeah, you're, you're getting some really neat yeah you're getting some really neat bands and some really neat records coming out oh yeah we're getting like I really like the, the the shoegazy black metal stuff that's coming out at the moment because I just mm-hmm. find like the weirdly they fit, like it weirdly yeah. fits. I think it's because like black metal so tortured and like the music of shoegaze can sound like that as well, and a lot of it is in that lo-fi realm. So oh, yeah, it, it, I can see, you know you can see how it kind of goes together. It's funny because back in the day, like I was never a shoegaze fan when shoegaze was shoegaze. 
and my friends told me like my bloody Valentine stuff. I'm like, I don't have time for this shit, you know, <laughs> uh, over the years, it really grew on me though. Uh, and then, yeah, hearing all these black metal bands mixed in that shoegazy sound, it sounds fucking awesome. Oh yeah. yeah like we, really we, we got like the chance to like speak to a uh, mole just before they released their new album. And like, we got a chance to listen to it like early and, I was there. It got me into like shoegazy black metal because I'm like, this shit's like amazing. So I'm going to fucking find it's just cut by cause me to just go on a whirlwind of just like, I'm like, I'm there like going, I never thought I'd listen to like, like you. I'd never thought I'd listen to shoe, shoegazy in my entire life. But I was there like, <laughs> yeah, as if I've got into yeah. this into this genre from black metal. Like, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I mean, when I first started hearing shoegaze, I was like super into grind. <laughs> I was like, I don't have fucking time for this. I want to listen to ass suck. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was like, what would you say with like the new album was like sort of the biggest challenge behind it? Um, the biggest challenge, I think trying like to fit my vocal style over some of these parts, mm. uh, I, yeah. I think was a little bit of a challenge and I was a little bit uncomfortable with a little bit of it at first because i'm like i don't know if this fits like am i gonna have to change how i'm singing uh yeah. to suit some of this stuff but then again we brought uh ryan our bass player uh we have him doing some clean vocals you can hear those a little bit on those two tracks they're like way buried in the background it kind of just adds to that like ethereal sound of the record though it makes it sound yeah you know adds to that little dreaminess of it or whatever but i think sticking the vocals to it uh after a while once we start, really got into it with the writing process everything started kind of you know, match and everything. We threw a lot more synthesizer on this record too. There's a lot more synth on it, like so almost through everything. Um, yeah. But so that was a little bit of a challenge, but, but yeah, other than that, the album came together pretty fluently. What about like the, um, the lyrical content and concepts like in the album? Um, you know, what, what inspired that mostly? And, you know, does this well, differ yeah. in this release than like the previous albums? Like, you know, what's, yeah. what was going through your mind so, when you were like, doing this? The other, the other records, uh, they're, they were pretty personal for me, like starting with yeah. Misery Rights. Uh, once we got out of that social political sort of aspect of the, the grind days of Wake after sowing the season of Worthless Tomorrow, Misery Rights was a lot, like it was all focused on me and my personal shit. I was going through a lot of stuff. After we did that record, honestly, I was, I kind of felt a little bit vulnerable after that, like talking about all that shit constantly and singing about it all the time. I was like, fuck, this is a little bit grating. Uh, so Devouring Rune was a mix of just like world issues, my own issues. And by the time we got to Confluence, that was when I started to get out of writing about my personal shit. Like that, that album was probably the last of it. And yeah. then when we started writing Thought Form Descent, uh, the boys, they sent me some demos. And I was writing the same old stuff that I would write to the other albums. I was writing it and I was just like, man, I'm like, I kind of feel played out on this. And honestly, we were in this, like the middle of a pandemic. Uh, I was in isolation for months, you know, and like, I don't know, the world was terrible. Things at home were too good. Uh, everything was looking pretty grim. And I was like, if I focus on all this terrible shit in the world again for another record, like I'm not going to be able to survive this shit. Like it's, it was just a little yeah. too much. So I was kind of like, I, I want some escapism and like, how do I go about that? So I was like, fuck it. I got this idea to write a story and, and put this story to the song. So I brought that to, to practice and told the guys like, fuck, do whatever you want you haven't let us down yet so <laughs> keep doing what you're doing like so every so this uh i guess the plot to this sort of story is what i've been saying is it's about this person who could more or less be me uh who finds themselves at odds with waking life and through the means of altered states uh meditation and lucid dreaming they find that there could be a little bit more to our reality through those avenues and for better or worse finds out what there is uh and yeah, so every song, I, I started like every song was a chapter, basically. So there's eight chapters nice. in this story. And yeah, that's that's pretty much how that came about. Do you find it like easier to, you know, so you said it's like quite personal for you to like write songs about yourself like, all the time, obviously, and I guess having to perform it as well all the time must be quite difficult. Was it easier to like put yourself in a different character's shoes and then write as a story, you know, a bit more metaphorical as opposed to like just doing it about yourself? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, there is some personal stuff throughout this record, but it's all dressed in allegory. Like, it's all metaphorical, too. Like, mm -hmm. you would never be able to tell that I'm singing anything about myself. But uh, okay. as, as for that, like, yes, um, because when I was writing songs like that, I have a bad habit of not being able to write lyrics when I'm in a good place in life. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, if, if I'm happy, how the fuck am I supposed to write metal songs? You know what I mean? So, uh, I, I'm the same. I'm the same. You, I cannot write so, if I'm in a good mood. Yeah, man. So it's like almost kind of self-destructive in a way where it was like, okay, it's time to write an album. Let's get as fucked up as you possibly can, and you know, make everything bad. And then we'll just write about it. Basically. Uh, so this time it, it was a lot easier and it was almost fun. Like it was for the first time, like writing yeah. lyrics was actually kind of fun. I couldn't wait to come home and write more, you know? So yeah, I found it a little bit easier. Oh yeah, I, I yeah. think like we've had like like a couple bands on, like sort of come out. I was like, oh, that you know, it's about story. And I find that I've tried it myself, and I find it it is a lot. It is a lot like a nice of a feeling just to like be able to separate, almost like a bit of escapism as well. Like yeah. it reminds me of like you know like when you're a kid and you have like an English like assignment. It's like oh, write a short story. I used to love that shit. Yeah. So yeah, like doing yeah, that, it's like it brings me back to it. And they're like, oh, I actually really enjoy just getting deep in my imagination sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel, I imagine it'll probably like a similar sort of a thing for you. Like, oh, it's like it's nice to just write like something that's like actually has like a story to it, and it it, it flows yeah, it, like, yeah, a, totally great like forms. Yeah. Um, yeah. what would you say? Like, so I feel like what you've said about the what the album's about might go into this, but I really liked the uh, the album art that you chose as well for it. Um, could you sort of take us through the creative process of that as well as like, you know, like what inspired that? I imagine it was probably through obviously the the actual story that you were telling. Yeah, I had never actually heard of the artist prior to this. I'd seen her work before, uh, not realizing who it was. Uh, but Rob, uh, our guitar player, he's the guy that kind of, he's like, hey, because uh, I think she did an album for a band called Earth, I want to say. I can't quite remember, but um Anyways, he was showing us her stuff because we went we went through a bunch of stuff like we had album art already for this record. And I was kind of the guy that was like, I don't know, it looks a little bit too metal. You know, it was just like it was yeah, like yeah. a skull with this thing and everything. I was like, it just looks too metal for what we're putting out. You know, oh, exactly. the, the album has, a, has like a very like dreamlike ethereal sound to it. And we wanted something to uh, represent that as well. So um I cannot remember our artist's name right now. <laughs> but uh, she, when we told her, uh, I sent her a bunch of lyrics and she, like, we gave her the idea and, and the album and she came back with that. And I think it does represent the album very well. It's, uh, it's kind of psychedelic looking, uh, which the yeah. album, we tried to, like, put that psychedelic sound into the record as well. So, Oh, yeah, it reminded yeah, me like, a, like a, a, an old school fantasy novel cover. Yeah. Like it reminded me of, of that sort of style. I, I I remember looking at it going, this could like have like you know like the the uh, like the old like ye old like text and it, it would it would <laughs> cool. it, it reminded me of, like of, of a fa- like a fantasy and it was I, I just yeah. I thought it was really good and then when I listened to the tracks, um it felt like it complemented the tracks very well, as well like you know like with all the elements in there. So I feel I feel uh, like it it, it could it it was perfect for that. Um, yeah. from just listening to obviously the tracks as far well as just yeah. looking at it, but yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're going for. So that, that's awesome that yeah, you're able to, to put those together. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. so now that you guys sound has, you know, obviously changed over the years, um, I think you started off like quite grind Corey and then now you've got like these black and doomy sections as well. Um, was that like a natural progression? Like, you know, you, you meant touching it before, like, you know, how things just came to be like, you know, just naturally, um what was that process like for you well i mean you know some bands are are happy with you know not putting the same record out but staying it within a genre and doing what they do good and some bands do it great and their fans love it and that's awesome uh for wake that just really isn't the case i mean wake has been a revol- like for, until, until a certain point was a pretty constant uh like revolving door of members <laughs> we had a lot of people okay. come and go <laughs> Uh, and during the grind days, like that was, that was great. And like, you know, we all cherish those times and you know, put up cool albums, play some great shows, get some great tours, but it just, you know, for wake, it just didn't seem like we wanted to just write grindcore over and over and yeah. over again. You know, like would people still care about us? If we were still putting out 19 minute albums. I don't know, like maybe, <laughs> uh, but just for us, it's like, you know, our taste in music over the years grew big time, you know? Back when I joined Wake, I was like listening to nothing but death metal and grindcore, a little bit of black metal here, you know, like, but it was just pretty much focused on those. And over the years, it's like, you know, it just changed into stuff like post rock, like electronic and like just everything, like any kind of music that there is, 
they're like somebody in wake listens to it, <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you know, so that we had all this different influence coming from every corner of the musical spectrum. And uh, we just wanted to experiment, do more, be bigger, you know, do, do bigger things. And I, we, we just wanted to take those influences and put them into our music and see what we could come up with. Do you feel oh, like yeah. the so, more like you guys get into different genres, like, and you know, that they, everything expands, do you think the more harder it is to write albums? Cause there's so much more to play around with now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and like, even, even when it comes to like lyrical content, like I've had other people ask me like, Oh, are you going to write another story for the next one? I'm like probably not. Cause I don't want to just repeat the same shit that I just did in the future. Sure. You know, but even lyrically, it's like now, you know, when we're getting into this t- territory, I mean, everything with Wake has been doom and fucking gloom, man. Like, it has not been nice lyrics. It hasn't been pleasant, you know, uh, songs or anything like that. Like, sonically, yes. Lyrically, no. <laughs> so getting into this, like, prettier kind of territory and stuff, it's kind of, it's it's weird to think about, like, where I'll go as a, as a writer, uh, like, yeah. lyricist. But, um, yeah. It's all part of the oh, journey, yeah. though, isn't it? I suppose. Yeah, it's all part of the journey, yeah. I like what you said about like, you know, like kind of on the, on the grind core stuff as well. It's like, yeah, I imagine like with Sean was like, that's only, only so much you can do because it's very, it's very, it's either this or something different. Like it's a very yeah. specific sound. So I imagine like sort of separating yourselves from it was probably refreshing in a way because it's like, oh, we can actually do more with our sound. Like, yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. It is, and it's like it's funny though because we will never get rid of that grindcore tag. It's not a, not like nothing that really bothers us, but still, people are like, oh, my favorite grindcore band is back. This is awesome. On new songs, I'm like, man, <laughs> I'm like, where, <laughs> where are people hearing grindcore in this? Like, it's cool. Whatever you get out of it is cool, but it's just funny how like gone so far away from that, but will always be labeled as a grindcore band. I think. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, I think that well, happens. Yeah, I think there's just like there's only so much you could ever do with with genres like that. I remember like I used to be in in a slam band, and like thank Christ, nothing has ever seen like light of day from that band. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> but like it was just one of those things where you'd come in, you'd write a track, and you're there like, oh, what can I do? I'll just do some pig squeals. Like, and it's just you get complacent. Yeah. And it's like, oh you yeah, eventually you just want something different. Y- yeah, and you know. There's, I always see this with bands too and bands that I really fucking like. And, you know, they put out all these really cool records and they get to this one record and that one record fucking works for them, you know, and that is like their sound. So now they're trying to write music that surrounds that album and always kind of sound like that. And they get themselves stuck into a box. And so everything almost kind of like every album that comes out afterwards is almost like another B-sides record from that great album that they're trying to sound like. You know, and I think with Wake, that's something that we always like, even though we're trying new things, we never want to be one thing specifically. Because, you know, when you start repeating yourself, that's when you start getting bored. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. there's nothing like what, for me as like a listener, there's nothing worse when I turn on like an album and I'm like, oh, it's kind of like an old one. <laughs> Heard this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. Uh, you know, I liked the old one. I think I might just listen to the older one <laughs> I, I do that a lot it's like i get two tracks and i'm like i'm going back to the other one <laughs> yeah it's like i feel like there's not a lot of a lot of bands need to just go yeah but like how can we just make it just a little bit different right like, yeah. even if it's just that little bit but and then again i suppose it's kind of a double-edged sword because if you make it a little bit different than all the other all the fans of that album but oh the change so man much. it's like oh, you know yeah. every Every album that Wake does, like before it comes out, we're like, fuck, did we just alienate half of our fan base? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, are people going to hate this? You know, and, you know, coming from Devouring Ruin to the Thought Form Descent record, it's pretty drastic. Like, it still sounds yeah. like Wake, but the people that love that record because it was like a blackened death record, like, they're not going to get, they're not going to hear that in this album. Like, they, they will, but it's going to be a lot prettier sounding, too. You know, it's not as dark as that record was, though. So. You know, this one too, we're like, fuck, are we going to like all those people going to hate this record or what? You know, but for the most part, everyone's just kind of down for the ride. I mean, the, yeah. the people that have been with us since the start know not to expect the same thing over and over. So I, I think a lot of people can expect us to just like constantly change throughout the years and every album cycle. Well, to be honest, like, you know, Metalheads are the most picky motherfuckers ever. Like, you know, you could do anything in Love It sounds too much like the old of all. This sounds too different. It's like, you can't please everyone, unfortunately, but I think. At least for me as a listener, like I, I do like it when bands just like just try something new, even if like yeah. they think that it didn't work or some fans think that it didn't work. Like I just respect it anyway because you know 
I think I always try something different, see how it goes. And then if it doesn't work, then fucking start doing it next time. <laughs> There's always next album, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. It's it's like I see so many bands get shit for just trying something new. I'm now like, hang on, you should be praising these guys because they're not making like just one album going, and this is all you're gonna get. And it's just yeah, it's like you know, and it's just a DLC on the album that you liked. It's like there you go. It's like yeah, well, and you know what? Though a lot of the time, with a lot of these super panned records that come out, and people are like, oh, this shit fucking sucks. Like it's way different than the, what they were doing before, and wh- whatever. You know, six months to a year down the road, is their favorite record by that band. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm guilty for it too. I've done it myself. Where I'm like, oh, I don't like this. Six months later, I'm like, what was my problem? Like this is a great record. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I've done it many times where I've been like, I've messaged Brad going, yeah, I don't think I like this album at all. And like a couple of months later, I'm like, Brad, this is like, I, I take back everything I've said about it. Like, <laughs> I was there, like, yeah, it's actually really good. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things I think like a lot of times when people try something new as well, they're normally sort of ahead of all the other bands in that sort of spectrum. So they're like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, we'll try this. And then like people who listen to that genre will go, no, nah, I don't like this. And then years later, every other band will sort of do what they did. And it's like, yeah. oh, wait, they were just ahead of the time on that. <laughs> totally. I and I think it's just the really. initial shock of, like, the initial shock of hearing a record that does that, too. You know, because you always expect a band to sound like a certain thing. And then when it doesn't, you're like, fuck that. I don't, don't care. You know, and then you have to kind of shed that opinion to be able to appreciate it fully. Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. I like it. I like it when a band, like, challenges you, you know, and it's like you got to come back a few times to, like, properly understand it or, like, you know, really enjoy it. I think the ones mm-hmm. that just let it simmer, you know, that they end up usually being my favorite records because, you know, totally. I feel like if you listen to an album, you like you enjoy it straight away. Like, you know, there's plenty that do that and it's good. But like the ones that proper challenge you are uh, usually the musically most creative, I think. Yeah. And I think those are the ones that have the most longevity, you know, when it comes to yeah. lasting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had like yeah. a, I had a friend when, when the new Turnstile album came out, like he was like proper hardcore kid. I was like, oh, have you listened to the new Turnstile? I was like, oh, I fucking hate it. I was there like, why? He went, well, what the fuck's this shit? What the fuck's this shit? And he like went on a rant about it. I might like, just give it a couple of listens. I reckon it's going to grow on you. And like he was like, no, no. I, I was like, don't hate your hate. Don't use the word hate. It's a strong word, mate. So yeah. like <laughs> about like two weeks later, yeah, I like this album now. <laughs> like, I'm there like, yeah, yeah. it's a good yeah. album. Like, it's just it, it, You know what? It, it truly is. And you know what? That's an album. And like for how big that record got, like, yeah, I can't cool. believe it. For a band like Turnstile, I'm like, I remember when I first heard that band, I'm like, sounds like 311, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> did not care at all. And then uh, my roommate, she really loves Turnstile. And then when the singles were coming out for this for the new record, I was kind of peeking at them. I'd listen to one or two. I'm like, yeah, it's okay, whatever. And then it came out. I listened to it once. I'm like, okay. And then a week later, that's all I was listening to. Oh, I, like, I did the same. I, I think yeah. I listened to yeah. it like a month straight. It. Yeah, and then, you know, I was showing it to people who were outside of, like, hardcore and metal, and even my friends that were into hard, like, metal, like, death metal and everything like that, like, extreme music, they're like, yeah, the new turnstile is great. It was, like, really loved over a very broad spectrum of people. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, saw, I, I got to see him uh, in February this, this year, and, like, mm-hmm. the range of people that were there was, like, you had hardcore kids, but you also have, like, had really, like, artsy-fartsy indie, indie kids, you had oh, like yeah. metalheads there. You just had a full range of people. I was there, like, it's like everyone that listens to every genre is in this one room right now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Man, if one band can bring them together, it's going to be turnstile. Sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I, I was just, I was stood there going, there's just such a range of people here. Like, but yeah, I want to kind of get into like uh, your hobbies and interests outside of work. What do you tend to like sort of get up to? Uh, I. I'm a collector of everything like horror and uh, weird. Uh, nice. I'm a huge Godzilla fan. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, have a huge Godzilla shrine over in the corner of my house. <laughs> really? Um, nice. Yeah. I uh, collect records. Uh, I really like horror movies, sci-fi. Um, other than that, man, I, I keep pretty chill. I go to shows, you know, watch movies. I don't leave that, leave that super exciting life. <laughs> what's, what's, uh, like the, what's your favorite horror movie? Yeah, my favorite horror movie. Mm. You know, one of my well, I will say Hellraiser, uh, one and two are probably my two of like my favorite horror movies that I've loved ever since I was a child. Yeah, good choices. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, actually, I was going to mention one of my current favorite horror movies is a movie called The Void. 
Have you guys ever heard of that movie? I haven't. No, it sounds familiar, see. but I haven't. I haven't uh, watched it. Great film. Uh, actually, the guy who's the second director on that movie, Michael Davidson, he's the guy who directed the Swallow the Light video. Oh, really? Put back, put cool. out back in March. Yeah. And That's I really had no idea. So Rob was our guitar player. Rob was like, "Yeah, uh, we've been talking to this guy, Michael. He's going to come down shoot this video." We're like, "Oh, cool." So I was looking at his credits. And it showed, showed on his credits, he was the second director of The Void. And instantly, I was like, what the fuck? I picked up my phone. And I called Rob. I'm like, dude, this guy directed The Fucking Void? He's like, yeah. I'm like, holy shit. Like, kind of lost it and fanboyed out for a second. Like, that's one of my favorite modern horror movies. <laughs> I bet you, I, I I bet you was like, I've got so many questions for him. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty much, like, biting my finger, trying not to, like, just be like, so what was this like? What was that like? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, I think my favorite horror movie is The Ring simply because of how much it stuck in my head like i watched it as a kid with my brother and we were there like how stupid is that right and then unplugged our tv when we went to bed <laughs> so yeah, I, exactly. you said you start taking like blurry same. cell phone photos you're like fuck yeah but just in case just unplug yeah that's it. Like, no, i'm not taking chances <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think that's that's my favorite just because it just stuck in my head as a kid and like i, I kept just feeling like oh wait a minute like what if it what what if what if though what if it was oh, one there's, of those there's always what ifs man i'm a 38 year old man and some nights i go to bed like my girlfriend and my roommate are gone right now and i have the place all to myself and like at night i go to bed i'm like you know watch a horror movie before bed and lay in bed i'm like fuck i'm like I should turn that turn that lamp on <laughs> yeah, <'cause it's> like, <laughs> put the night light on <laughs> yeah i i remember like seeing like a proper late night show and i can't remember what horror movie it was but it was, fuck it i think it was sinister or something like that um, and one. that was another like horror film that kind of that stuck with me like a little bit that was yeah you know like all those blumhouse movies i'm not a huge fan of but sinister was actually a pretty scary movie Oh yeah, yeah the cool second one's well. not, not good at all, but like the not first good. one not was good. so good. But like, yeah. I think it was like a late night showing of that. And like we were like, I think we were walking to a car or something like that at the, at the, in the middle of the night. And I was there like, just like, she's like, you, 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 like just slowly speeding up. <laughs> Absolutely shit. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, I think the film for Growing me- Growing like, man um, still scared of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. I think the film that like, really stuck with me was- um, have you seen Midsummer? Like, you know, the guy who did like oh, Hereditary, yeah. like them two films. Right. Like, I, I mean, I've watched like so many horror films. I've kind of become desensitized. Like it takes a lot for ones to like actually freak me out. Like I enjoy them all. Um, there is a lot of shit out there, but there's a lot of fucking sick ones as well. But, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Midsummer. I thought that was, it was just such a like very abstract and so weird and like gory in like a different way. Like not like Saw, because I could watch Saw and be like, absolutely fine. But then I watched this and like some of the gore and that was like, this is so realistic. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is like when I because I started watching horror movies when I was a kid, like I was like yeah. eight years old going to my next door neighbors house watching the child's play movies and Freddy movies, Nightmare on Elm Street and everything. Uh, so like gore, I'm pretty desensitized, man. And like when I was a young teenager and found out there was this whole underground realm of horror movies that were like borderline, like not snuff films, but just like realistic, like gore films. Yeah. Um, I kind of delved into those and like, I've seen everything, you know, and it doesn't really phase me anymore. I don't really like that kind of shit anymore. Like the whole torture porn stuff just doesn't do it. Guess, guess yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, way I, over it. But that's the thing is like now movies like Midsummer and that director's uh, film before that hereditary, like great fucking films. And they're more psychological than they are gruesome. Yeah. It's oh, the yeah. way that he captures like emotions. That is like the most freakiest part of it. Cause like, you know, the way that people break down and just stuff like that. Like, wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he just knows how yeah. to hit it. Well, well yeah, it's, it's like, shit. it's all in daylight and you're still like, I feel like still creeps out here. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> normally like a lot of horror movies can hide it where it's like, oh, it's nighttime. What's that in the bushes? And you're there like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like that one was daylight, you know, like, I, I just don't feel right here. Yeah. Like, I'm sure there's a, like a handful of movies that are all, that all take place in, in daylight. But Midsummer is like the most mainstream one for sure. And it's weird that there's like it's just all day like that time. Oh yeah, I, I, one one film that like really creeped me out was uh Mars, and that kind of came out in like the torch porn era, fucking like gore films. I watched like, which a, one? Martyrs. Have you ever oh, heard Martyrs. of Martyrs? Yeah, yeah, Martyrs that, was fucked, man. <laughs> the, the ending to that, I, like, <laughs> I, I was like frozen. I was like, because I watched like a disturbing movie Iceberg, and that was like on like probably the top. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, it, I watched a YouTube deep. video. 
Yeah, I and I was a YouTube like, video about about that iceberg the other day. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> it went all the way down to the bottom of stuff like where the guy who was you know describing everything couldn't even fucking find the bottom movies on the internet. So, <laughs> oh yeah, was it Wendigoon by any chance? I think it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, because he had the, his... the Wendigo poster in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. watched his like videos religiously, so we probably we probably watched the same one. But that was the one that turned me on to like watching Mars. I was going like, okay, well, he said this was pretty timid compared to the rest, and it sounded interesting, so I stuck it on. Yeah, the... watched it all, and I was the... like, that was fucked. <laughs> yeah, man. So the company, uh, well, so there was the whole like French ex- uh, ex- French extreme films that came out in the early two thousands. Martyrs being a part of that. There's another movie called Inside that came out with them in like, like high tension. I don't know if you've heard of those, but uh, there's a bunch of North American remakes. Like they remade Martyrs and they remade Inside and they're fucking terrible. They made it for like a North American <laughs> audience and it just took everything out of those movies. That was good. Oh, yeah. Which is, I guess, a lot of the case with North American remakes. You watch like Let the Right One In, Let Me In. It's the same thing. Like North oh, yeah, American one like, stuff. Uh, yeah. Even like Old Boy, because like the Korean version's much more like oh, disturbing. Look, like it's weird. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the fuck? Dude, right here beside me. <laughs> that is yeah, so like, true. The Korean version is like way more, like way worse than the actual like American one. Like the American one, like I watched that first and I was there, like, Wow, I was pretty fucked, and we went watch the Korean version, and then I watched it. I was like, ah, nah, <laughs> I, I couldn't. It, yeah, it, that stuck in my head as well. I was there, like that was just, I can't even think of like who would think of shit like that. <laughs> Man, that, yeah, that whole reveal at the end, I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, are you serious? Like, no I way. To, like, I, need to get watch I, I, I paused it, and I was like, I need to like take a minute because that, that's just take like, a breather. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I need to like get a list of all these films and just like you know binge watch them all because I've been like uh, I've been waiting for like a good horror film for a while to watch. So yeah, man. I mean, that's the thing. Like, so I'm like looking at my horror movie collection right now. There's a lot of uh, new movies. I'm not. I don't know. There's something about new movies that a lot of them don't really do it for me. I'm like stuck in the 80s and early 90s when it comes to that stuff. Uh, yeah. I think CGI is just ruined film though, for the most oh, part, absolutely. especially horror yeah. movies. Because now it's like you, there's an overabundance of shitty ass zombie movies where like somebody gets shot and there's just like CGI blood splatter all over the place. Like, man, it just takes you right out of the movie. Uh, So, like, all the 80s stuff, like Reanimator from Beyond, like that really goopy practical effect horror stuff, that's up my alley. Like, I love that shit. It actually looks better though. Like, the more natural it is, like, it it just looks more realistic in a way. Like, I I say the comparison between like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Like, I I love The Hobbit films, but like, if you compare the special effects between that and then Lord of the Rings, even though Lord of the Rings (laughs) is 20 years earlier, it looks so much better. Yeah. Man, it's like you see those orcs and they're all CGI in The Hobbit. And like, right away from the first 10 minutes when I went to that movie, I was like, I'm going to hate this. And then the fucking dwarves were singing and doing all this shit. And I was like, what is riding down he's like surfing down the fucking thing in that barrel and stuff yeah. it was really bad it was really bad oh yeah, I, yeah. I think like because it goes in that uncanny valley i think that's why it takes you out like, yeah because you're yeah. there like yeah but i saw like especially if it's like a remake or something like have you like the remake of the the thing have you ever seen the test i would footage? say well, as soon as you said that i was good yeah i was like the thing came right into my mind where they, where they use actual practical stuff and then they went oh no let's cg it i'm like but the practical shit you had was way better like <laughs> yeah. yeah you know it's funny because i actually it was like it had to be three or four nights ago i was like i'm gonna watch the thing remake or the, the prequel again because you know knowing that after that came to light and the the people who made it were like yeah there's practical effects under all those all that cgi i'm like okay i'm gonna see and like honestly there's not a lot in that movie that looks like there could have been practical effects unless they just completely reshot everything Oh, right, well, have you ever watched like the behind the watch the behind the scenes because like the practical effects that they did was so so solid. Oh, they do like, have them in the behind the scenes. Yeah, so you can actually watch oh. like they're the, like the uncut stuff where it's like where, where it wasn't covered over by CGI. Yeah, and yeah. the practical effects was really really solid, and like I think for some reason the studio was like, oh, it just doesn't look the way we want it to. But when you watch the the outtakes, you like you should have just stuck to your guns and been like, no yeah. practical. I mean, that's the thing, though, is, like, there's a fine line for some people. Like, me growing up in horror, like, cheesy shit does not bother me. You know, I watch a movie like Basket Case, and then you got this stupid fucking hunk of rubber going, uh, you know, bouncing around the screen. Yeah. And to some people, it looks fucking stupid. You know, they're like, that's dumb. I don't want to watch that. To me, I'm like, it's awesome. What are you talking about? 
looks great. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like even like the it, Evil it Dead, still... like the fucking classic, like you know, the is mostly practical effects in that, and it looks it looks better than the remake. Yeah. And it, it it's just the atmosphere that they build and like the effects that they use. Like I think it just really takes you out of the film when you can just obviously tell it's not real. So I don't know. Why uh, it it totally it. takes me out. Yeah, and even even if the practical effects look bad, at least they're really in the film. At least they're physically there. Yeah. Oh yeah. I find it's a lot where you, when you watch actors, like they get a lot better of a performance. Like if you watch like the prequels, like you really feel sorry for like the like all, all the actors that did the prequels because at the end of the day, like this, it was pretty new technology with green screen. So they're like, oh, yeah. the acting's like really like stone and like the, they it looks like they don't know how they're feeling in the scene. I'm like, yeah, because they're talking to a fucking tennis ball. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly, man. Exactly. It's it's weird. It's like. Yeah, like I know actors are actors and you have to be able to act in any situation. But I mean, fuck, man, they're just sitting there in front of it, standing there in front of a screen. You know, when oh, you're yeah. actually yeah. in a location, you're going to feel that and be there. Uh, the, the whole green screen thing is weird and it's very noticeable in movies. Oh, yeah. Have you ever seen the, uh, <laughs> the CGI pair in the Star Wars prequels? No. <laughs> right. If I point it out. Rewatch him because you won't be able to not see this CGI pair. A CGI pair? I, I'm gonna YouTube but, this after whatever. There's, a, there's a bit <laughs> where Padme and like Anakin are eating, like they're cutting up a pair, right? And like it's so bad CGI. You, like you, <laughs> but, like, it's like one of those things. Like once you notice it, you can't unsee it. Like the like it looks like it's just like cloth. It just and like the oh cutting. Oh my it, god! And like the arms aren't even syncing up. So like. Because I think the fox is CGI for some reason as well. Why? Why would he CGI stuff that you could literally just use? Well, yeah, no, I don't get why they didn't give him a, a pair. And a, but I, I found out the reason is because they had see-through plates where if I can't remember, there was a reason why, but the, the, the plates were reflective. So if they gave him an actual pair, they would, oh, would fuck up the shadow in and they'd have to do all this shit. So it was easier to CG the pair in and put the yeah. fake shadow there than rather than cop out all the, the, fit, like, the real yeah. shit. Something like that. And like, it's just like you're watching it and like, you can tell like as well, like, it's just kind of like, you're at a dining table. What does it look like? <laughs> we don't know yet. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. And well, like, imagine acting, it for us. <laughs> yeah, it's like, the acting, it, they're like, just talking. But like, once you notice that fucking pair, it's hard not to watch yeah. it. And it, I was well, like, I, I did hear a long time ago uh, that you're not allowed to have actual knives on, on set. Of a movie, oh, so yeah, maybe yeah, that yeah. had, because yeah, like obviously if somebody cuts their fucking fingers off or something, but maybe that's why they had just like I would have just skipped the scene and maybe not had focus on a fucking CGI pair, but whatever. Yeah, it's a lot of work <laughs> for something that people don't even care about, you know. But the yeah, thing is, when you watch the CGI breakdowns, like they put so much of this work in, but you know for a fact some guy will, like, All right, it's your job to do the pair, and he's like, right. I've already spent like. 12 hours making this fucking like this yeah. this grand hallway that they're eating in yeah but imagine pair. like building up your cv in the portfolio like finally i get to be in the, you know i get to do a star wars film look, look what i've done and then it's just like oh it's just a cg you were the pair, pair guy <laughs> you, you're, you're on the pair yeah <laughs> Fuck. yeah it's, it's it's a very funny it's very funny see once you once you notice it, it, I'm, it gonna I, check that out. I, I'm just i just loop it it's funny you're going to make me watch something from the prequels for the first time since they came out. Hey, mate, it's, be it's better than the Disney ones. I, I that's how I see it. it. I was like, it's like, at least it's better than like the Disney ones that came after. Because at least yeah. they had like a coherent story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a franchise that honestly, man, I didn't even want. For how much I love science fiction and, you know, the realm of like, you know, pop culture and everything. Uh, I didn't see the first Star Wars trilogy till about 10 years ago. Oh, really? I fucking hate Star Wars fans, man. It's like the fandom of that <laughs> shit just drives me insane. See, I, I I got it given to me by my because like we didn't have like we we didn't have like a DVD player or all that. We were quite slow with moving on to new technology in my family, but like we had VHS for years. I mean, was it the gave, black and gold box set? Yeah, it, she gave me like That's the, the full on like original <laughs> yeah. trilogy, like, and yeah. I, I I watched like Return of the Jedi that much. I wore out the tape. So like it was like, that was my favorite Star Wars movie. So I got it into it just because I loved it as a kid. And then like yeah. I watched them. The prequels came out. So I had like I grew up on that on on the original, but it was like the prequels were the ones I was seeing in the cinema. So I still mm -hmm. have like a really good like relationship oh, with those movies as well. Yeah, that's very fair, man. Nostalgia like rules all, man. 
man. That's uh, yeah, like really stuff does. that I liked when I was a kid is still sacred to me as an adult. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. the stuff that I watch now, like in hindsight, this was terrible, but actually, it's still good because nostalgia's taken over here. <laughs> <laughs> I felt the same when I watched um I, I used to love like Alien versus Predator as a kid. And obviously I know that like mm-hmm. Alien and Aliens and the first Predator are like absolutely loved by everyone. But then no, I, yeah. I I was in the impression like, oh everyone loves this film. And then you speak to people about it, like, oh it's fucking trash that what the fuck they're thinking. <laughs> I'm just like, You're like, what, what are you talking about? This movie's <laughs> yeah, it's great. They, 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 uh, they, do, they do the fight and stuff, you know? <laughs> it's like yeah, to, exactly. There's monsters, there's it. fighting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was cool. Um, yeah. So we are sort of getting to the end point of the interview now. Um, one way that we always like to leave it is what advice would you give to a new musician starting out and what advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, God, don't drink and smoke so many cigarettes if you want to be a vocalist because it fucks <laughs> your throat right off. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm on this now because I noticed yeah. like, when I was doing that's like him. vocals, like tracking, I, I'd lo- I was losing breath control so much. Yeah, uh, I, I have a I have a bad habit of smoking darts when I drink, so it's uh, <laughs> I, I like to drink. <laughs> With a a so, cigarette and a beer just goes so well together. It's a perfect pairing. Yeah. Like that's the thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I was I was doing the vape for a while there, but yeah, I just fucking went back to cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, I find it's like you have if you have like full fat coke all your life, and then suddenly go, I'm just gonna drink diet from now on. You're there, like hey, it does the trick, but the summit's still missing. Like, that's yeah. what I always found yeah. it as. Yes. Don't, smoke. <laughs> yeah. don't smoke. Yeah, don't smoke. Don't, don't drink. Smoke. Don't do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one of those like nineties TV adverts or something. <laughs> don't do drugs, kids. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it's a PSA for everybody, <laughs> not just musicians. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, it's been sick having you on, by the way. Um, I've had a great chat. It's been fun to nerd out about some horror films. And uh, I can't wait to listen to the album because the concept sounds amazing. And uh, if it's anything like the singles that we've heard, I'm sure it's going to be sick. So, yeah, oh, yeah thank man. you so much. Awesome. It was great chatting with you guys. Thanks for having me. No worries. Oh, yeah. It's been great talking to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care, guys. Hopefully we'll see you Take in the care. UK. It's awesome time soon. Yeah, Absolutely. I hope. I hope we get back there soon.